GoPro is full. So, season one, episode seven, featuring Mark Suster from Upfront Ventures. Also known as Dawn Patrol. Mm. Curious? Watch the episode. Mm. One, episode seven, featuring Mark, why am I yelling? Season one, episode seven, <laughs> featuring Mark Suster from Upfront let's, Ventures. Let's sing it, let's sing this one. <clears throat> How, what to do? Well, let's just see if we get it together. All right. One, I'll come two, in. Three. Season one, <laughs> episode <laughs> seven, featuring Mark Suster from Upfront Ventures. Ventures. Okay. One more. We ran out of room on our GoPro and we forgot to do the featuring sign. So, Featuring. Season 1, Episode 7. Featuring. Mark Suster from Upfront Ventures. Dot com. I actually think it's upfront.vc. <laughs> <laughs> getting a pickup truck. Why? I'm, go I'm getting a pickup truck. You're not going to actually get a pickup I truck. I think I really am. You're going to be the only person in the history of the universe to buy a pickup truck and never put a single thing in the bed. That is not true. I will put plenty of stuff in the bed. Like what? Golf clubs. <laughs> Why don't you just drive a golf cart? Well, that only holds two golf clubs. You get a super-sized golf cart. I'm worried that people are going to see me in a pickup truck and think I'm more masculine than I am. Yeah, that's going to be a real issue. People are going to think you're masking. You're going to see me driving it and be like, whoa, I got must haul a lot of lumber. <laughs> if you could only eat one food for every meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? I'm going to need, like, more parameters. One dish. Am I still gluten-free? Do I have my no. normal dietary restrictions? No, no dietary restrictions. One dish. It'll sustain you. You'll be healthy. Is it a main dish and I can add it's any accoutrements? No. It's the same exact thing every single time. Yeah. So, like, it's not like pizza and then I can have pepperoni pizza or pineapple no. pizza or... Right. Is it... Is it the complete dish? Oh, my gosh. You're so annoying. Well, is it, like, burger and fries or is it just burgers? It's a complete dish. It'd be a burger and fries. Really? Yeah. For breakfast? I mean, Lunch and dinner? Okay. Yeah. Gross. What would yours be? Donuts. You understand how quickly you would get sick of donuts and the sweetness? <laughs> no, no, I'd never get sick of yes, donuts. Yes, you would. That is, no. You cannot eat donuts like that. Yeah, I can. No. That's the worst choice I've ever heard. <laughs> I'm judging your choice. That is a ridiculously dumb choice. You don't think these things through. Okay, I'll take it back. I have a new one. Okay, it's going to be just as bad. No, 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 no. Okay. Cupcake. Call from Mark Schuster. To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press 2. Mark Suster from Upfront Ventures is joining us on Carpool VC. Mark has been a big mentor of ours, and it's, we're excited to be chatting with you. So thanks for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Brett, Brett wants to start by asking you a question about sports that I don't understand. Jonathan doesn't even know who this person <laughs> is. But after yesterday, would you say Chip Kelly is on the hot seat? I'd say if the rest of the season even goes remotely how yesterday went, Chip Kelly will not be back next year. I would go as far as to say that. Is Chip Kelly a singer? Yes, Chip <laughs> Kelly is a, a singer. Chip Kelly is the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. So if Chip Kelly were a startup, which startup would Chip Kelly be? Uh, if Chip Kelly were a startup, it's hard to say right now after two games because I feel like I need to see 16 before I can properly judge him. But if Chip Kelly was a startup, I would say it was like the launch of color. You know, it launched <laughs> to a big thud. Uh, but I do believe that color still had the right product idea had they stuck around for 16 games. So let's hope the analogy there holds. Okay, good, good. So... You have a wildly popular blog, which we read frequently. Um, what are you? Have you publicly talked about like how big your readership actually is? Yeah, no, I appreciate the comments. Thank you. Uh, my following on my blog is highly dependent on how often I write. When I get in a real good 
swing of things and I write three, four times a week, I'm getting four to 500,000 readers. Um, if I write a little bit less frequently, like write once or twice every two weeks, it usually drops down to like 250. Rookie. Uh, well, so, I, so with the readership that large, how much of your success as a VC, not as an entrepreneur, but as a VC, do you think is in part because of the blog? Well, I think any success that I have, and I'm not willing to yet say that I've been a undeniable success, but any successes that I have, there's a high correlation between the two activities. Number one, the fact that I put myself out there helps entrepreneurs to self-identify with whether I'm the right type of investor for them. People feel like they know you, and I'm pretty authentic in what I write. I just kind of write what's on the top of my mind. So that appeals to some people because they feel like they know the way I think and act and how I will behave even in private, and hopefully you guys can confirm that. Uh, and I may not be for everybody, so some people who may not feel aligned with me can also filter themselves out. But the second thing about blogging is that it really helps me to refine my ideas because if I publish on certain concepts and people disagree with me, we can have a pl public debate, which only makes me better. And then finally, I would say my number one objective is not to maximize readership, but to maximize share of mind. If I write about online video, I can pretty much guarantee you if I put up enough effort to write something that's thoughtful, it will get read by most of the uh, senior executives in that industry. Um, so if I choose my topics well and I write about things that I'm passionate about, um, the right people will read it and I will be able to engage in a dialogue, which is really hard to do. So one of the things, you weren't always at a firm called Upfront. I believe uh, before Upfront it was GRP. Um, and so I'm curious about what the process of rebranding was like and if uh, you can share some of the ideas that maybe are on the cutting room floor. So we wanted a more memorable name that we thought aligned with what our brand interests are. And so for us, Upfront represents the fact that what you see is what you get. So WYSIWYG. Number two is we're pretty direct. We tell you what we think. Sometimes that works well. Sometimes people don't like that. But as a general bias, we want to be direct with people. And we're early stage investors, and we want to stay early stage. So the combination of being direct, being early, what you see is what you get, um, that really resonated with us, and that's why we changed brands. Did you, were there any names that were like high up there that you guys did not go with? We worked with a branding firm uh, that helped us not only with the name but with our identity and our logo. It's called Red Antler, and we had a really good experience with them. The first version, they came up with five names for us, and we didn't like any of them. They were pushing us really hard on a name called Dawn Patrol, uh, and – what Dawn Patrol is, is it's the first people who go out on a beach in the morning. It's the people who are doing, they're on cleanup, they're on, they're the first surfers, they're fixing the beaches, whatever. They're the early risers. And what they liked about it was it represented go-getters who were up early and kind of maybe tied into the fact that we're based in L.A. But the problem is, like, I'm a 47-year-old nebbish Jewish kid, right? Like, I'm not the first kid on the beach. I'm lucky if I'm on the beach and not lathered up in too much sunblock. Um, and so it just didn't really fit with culturally who we are, so we didn't go with it. You are so long L.A., and you talk about it frequently. Um, what, what's the one thing, though, and be honest, that you don't like about L.A.? And the answer cannot be traffic. Uh, L.A. is a fantastic place to develop a business. We are the second largest city in America behind New York. We have a really rich and diverse talent base here, not just we graduate more engineers in L.A. than anywhere else in the country. We have more top 25 universities, engineering universities, than anywhere else in the country. You know, NASA, JPL, 
you know, we launch all the rockets. All the rocket launches are designed initially here, not launched from here. Uh, we have the aerospace and defense sector. And, of course, we're the creative capital of the world, uh, both in terms of writers, producers, uh, actors, and so forth. And we have a long history of developing software companies as well. The challenge is, um, you know, really – we don't have enough product managers and enough engineers that have seen scale. And so if you were at Oracle or Salesforce or Google or Facebook or any of these great com NorCal companies, even eBay or PayPal, and you operated at a certain scale, if you worked at LinkedIn, you just have experiences that other people don't have that are insanely valuable. And that's something that I think is missing from our community. Um, and we, we do try to get people down here who bring those backgrounds. We have a lot of people now from Google and Facebook living in LA. Uh, Snapchat is really the best thing that's happened to us because you now have a generation of young people at Snapchat who are developing experiences operating at that scale. Tinder is an amazing thing to happen to us because in Tinder, you have a team of people that saw that rapid growth. And I think all of the VP level people at those companies are going to go on in the next five years and start their own businesses. And that's going to be a huge positive for LA. If there's a deal that comes across your desk and you absolutely fall in love with it, but your partners aren't on board at all, Let's, let's, say, let's just say, for example, say they vehemently like hate it. What happens? What's the process? I think that's a phenomenal question. I wish more people asked questions like that. Uh, so, look, we have a belief. We have an ethos in our firm. We have five full-time partners, and we also have principals and associates who are very smart that we listen to. Um, if there's consensus and everybody loves a deal – Usually I become a little more skeptical because obvious ideas tend to drive consensus, and we operate on a principle of conviction. In other words, someone with a really crazy out-there idea like U-Beam, uh, you guys know it, we're co-investors in the company, that wants to transfer wireless electricity – it's such a big idea that, of course, there's going to naturally be people who are skeptical. And we look for deals like that, but we're looking for partner conviction, that the person who backs the deal uh, really believes in the entrepreneur, the team, uh, the market, the concept, has done enough due diligence to get comfort that this is a big idea. And I don't mind if we're wrong. I mean, shame on us if we do 30 deals in one fund and none of them are hugely ambitious, and all of them kind of seek to get two to three X. Venture capital uh, exists based on power law of returns. It's we should have one deal that returns five times our fund or four times our fund or even one time our fund. Um, and so you really have to go for ideas that some people just scratch their head, and I think in time our best deals will come from that. Now – the question is, the people who are against the deal, um, what is the basis of them being against it? We try to use that feedback to the partner to go away and test their conviction. Like, you know, if it's a husband and wife co-founding team and one person on the team has such bad experience with husband and wife teams and says, you really need to spend more time trying to understand the personal dynamic between the husband and wife because we've had – that experience with that, then that partner takes it away to do due diligence on that topic and figure out if it's something they should care about. So I like uh, when there's controversy and we're looking for conviction and we're looking for you to stick your head, you know, your neck on the proverbial chopping block and say, if this deal struggles, if things go poorly, that you're going to roll up your sleeve and really take it seriously and own responsibility for helping make things better. You've got three people behind a curtain and you can ask one question to all three of them and based on their response you have to marry one of them on the spot what's the question you ask i think my question is uh do you like curb your enthusiasm <laughs> mark thank you so so much for taking the time really appreciate it brett and i put out 
you know, we don't we don't write off expenses from the fund to make Carpool VC, and it costs about a dollar a week. So we're always looking for sponsors. So would you be interested in sponsoring Carpool VC this week for one dollar? I would be. It would be my pleasure. This week brought to you by Mark Suster, partner at Upfront Ventures. Check him out. Long LA. Long LA. Hashtag. <laughs> I'm rooting for your Eagles, and uh, we're big Thank fans you. of everything you're doing. Keep up all the awesome work, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Can you beatbox at all? <laughs> no, I can't beatbox. Not at all? I can go, like, make a simple beat. Let's hear a simple beat. Wait, that was a simple beat. Well, you beatbox. Go ahead. Let's hear your sick, multi-layered beats. Okay. Okay. Yours was really bad. Well, I did. I said no. The answer to the question was no. You said, "Can you beat back?" You said, said you, "No." You said you could do a simple beat. That was a simple beat. Simply bad. Okay, go. Okay, that was better. Here's the thing, though, is like in in your head, you're, you're like a good beatboxer, and and yours was way better than mine. Still bad. You went burf at the end. I didn't go burf. You went. Okay, first of all, I don't look like I'm regurgitating. That was you.